Hello everyone, this is Grant Friedman, editor of PSD Tuts, and today I'm speaking with Anthony Harmon, creative director for Slash 3, and uh, principal for A Harmon Design Group. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Grant. I really appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's an honor, and uh, so thank you very much. Okay, my first question um, is for maybe some of our readers who might not know what, it's, what an art collective is. And um, so would you explain a little bit about an art collective, uh, what's its purpose, why join, and what do members get out of the experience? Sure. Um, I'll start by saying for me personally that art collectives are, have been an awesome experience. Um, they've been a platform for growth, uh, both artistically and also uh, just connecting and, and interfacing with the community and people. Um, there's three main things that I think people are going to get out of joining an art collective. The first would be that you are going to be able to receive and give feedback and critique on your artwork, um, which is really invaluable as far as uh, growing and, and having um, the areas of your skill set that maybe you're not necessarily noticing that you're missing. Um, and the second thing is that people are going to connect and network with you on a, a level that is really not possible outside of a community like that. Um, like for me personally, I've, I've met and connected with people in 40 or 50 different countries at this point, um, which has been incredible. Uh, you know, and, and luckily for me, I guess the, the primary language on the internet is English. Um, and so all these kids, it's remarkable, you know, ranging from 16, 17 years old up into 65 years of age. We have a member in Slash 3. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, and, and from all around the world, 40 countries, 50 countries, something like that. And, and uh, so, you know, you get a little taste of culture from different places around the world. Um, and you get that that is reflected in the, the artwork that's created there. So you're getting these cultural flares popping up in people's work. And uh, you know their different opinions, and, and it's it's really a cool experience. And the third thing, of course, is uh, exposure. All right. The whole the whole purpose for the collective is sort of power in numbers, and so people bind together and release these exhibitions, which uh, usually consist of anywhere from forty to like eighty pieces of artwork. Um, and that's an attempt to to make more of a cohesive, singular uh, exhibition, if you will. Um, something that can be released as a, a single piece of work and that's going to be not necessarily more validated, but it's just, uh, you know, if you have a larger scale project, it's going to get the attention of more people. So wow. those are kind of the three main things that people are going to gain out of a collective and, uh, and what it really is. So Now, um, you know, I know that there's um, several art collectives out there. I know there's, you know, Depth Core, um, Intrinsic Nature, I think. Um, so what makes Slash 3 unique from the other collectives? That's a good question, and uh, it's, it's one that I'm definitely excited to answer. I would say up until about six months ago, there wasn't a whole lot separating Slash 3 from the other collectives. Um, that's not to say that the other guys aren't doing fantastic things. Um, I think there's, for whatever reason, just been a real increase in um, the, the motivation, the drive, and the passion with the staff sort of the behind the scenes aspect to Slash 3. Um, and for whatever reason, we've just really honed in on trying to, to push the whole notion of what a collective is to the next level. I think um, the, the standard model up to this point, it's not archaic, but it's, it's certainly outdated. Um, you know, the, the current model is like we've talked about, people buying together, they uh, create these exhibitions every two to three months, and, uh, and that's really it. Um, what we're aiming to do with Slash 3 right now is to integrate with things like social media, um, podcasts like we're doing now, and uh, the blogging platforms, really enhance and, and, uh, and utilize, I guess, the different mediums that are out there now and try and, and integrate them into Slash 3 in order to bring it up to, to current times and current technologies. Um, additionally, we're working to uh, provide paying client work for the artist core that we have. Um, that's something that I don't think any other collective has been able to achieve up until this point. Um, and it's something, it's the next logical step for us because uh, we've gotten to the point where we're being approached pretty consistently from clients and they're really on our site right now isn't a, uh, a platform or a way for these, these people to connect to our artists directly um, when they are in fact interested in hiring them for a project. 
Um, so all those things are, are kind of new and, and are uncharted territory. So they're exciting and, and uh, you know, we're proud to be pushing it into the next realm and, and it's going to be exciting to see what happens over the next six months or so. So, Wow, it sounds like you guys are, are doing some really exciting things. Um, you mentioned your 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 uh, your exhibitions, and your your last one was uh, called Paradigm Shift. And right. would you be able to tell our readers a little bit about Paradigm Shift? Um, how did it come about? And uh, you know what pieces kind of stuck out to you? Absolutely, yeah. I'm actually going to pull it up on my screen really quickly so I can reference the uh, the pieces. Um, Paradigm Shift is the name of our latest exhibition, typically uh, referring back to the standard model of art collectives. Uh, the procedure is to come up with a theme, and uh, all of the artists are given the brief, and they come up with their own interpretation of, uh, of, of what the theme name means to them. Um, and those packs are released every three to four months or so. Um, our latest one is Paradigm Shift. And... Uh, I'm going to log in here. So some of the pieces that really stood out to me in this last exhibition were, uh, first and foremost, he's one of our newer artists. And uh, he's a Russian guy, doesn't speak a lot of English. And so he's not too active in the forums and, and with the community. But he is very active as far as uh, submitting artwork and, and participating as far as, as that's concerned. Um, his name is Anton Semenov. Uh, the piece that I'm going to refer to first is called Society, and uh, Anton goes under the alias of Gloom uh, as well. So this piece, Society, I think really, really pushed the, the limitations of what you can do in Photoshop. Um, this thing is made out of well over a hundred arms that are all coming together and forming a face, a spooky looking face. And uh, conceptually, Anton always nails right on the head. Um, the, the theme is paradigm shift. And his little tagline here on the bottom of this piece is bigger fish eat the little ones. And it's fantastic because all of these little arms are coming together and binding and, and creating this bigger fish, so to speak, you know. Um, and of course, it's got its mouth open like it's ready to swallow the viewer hole and, and the it's a really cool piece. Technically speaking, it's unbelievable, too. Um, right. and, and it's been pretty widely circulated around the Internet, I think, for, for both its concept and, uh, and its technical execution. Um, so that's an awesome piece. I've, I was blown away, literally, when I saw that one. Um, it's very creepy. It's very creepy. It's very <laughs> it's dark, very as is all yeah. of his work, actually. Uh, yeah. Anton is a very, uh, artistically, I don't know him as a person, but artistically, he's a very, very dark guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the second piece is uh, by, and I'm sure I'm going to pronounce this wrong and I apologize, but uh, it's by Roger de Boisvive, or Roger, he's French, uh, and it's called Altered. Um, the reason I really like this one is because Roger's been developing a, uh, a really unique style, um, and the process, which he is uh, actually published online as well, is, is really unique. Um, at first glance for me when I saw this, I thought it was completely rendered uh, as a 3D object and then uh, you know textured in Photoshop or something like that. But he created all these 3D components uh, using vectors, which was a cool, unusual, I think, approach for creating something like this. Um, I just love the, the style. It's, it's very unique. I don't think anybody else is producing anything quite like this right now. And, uh, you know, Roger likes to keep it fresh. He's one of those guys that uh, every six months or so, he totally changes up his style and tries something new until he really perfects it and feels like he's finished with it and moves on to the next thing. So I really enjoyed this piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very nice piece. And let's see what else. Oh, another one from Gloom we'll touch on just really quickly is called uh, Evil. And just conceptually, I really enjoyed this one. It's It's not necessarily his like most impressive technically uh but just from a conceptual standpoint i thought it was fantastic uh it's of a ring from an aerial perspective and there's several figures in the piece that are outside kind of scratching their heads uh wondering what's going on and, and as far as theme relation to paradigm shift 
uh, I thought it was it was really clever because the viewer, the people that are looking at the piece, are privy to this little what's going on in the center of this ring, whereas everybody else on the outside is is lost and they have no idea what's going on. And so there's the paradigm shift right there. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We also talked about Zone Zero. Uh, this is done by Yvonne Fusi. Again, I'm going to pronounce these names wrong, and I'm going to get yelled at for it later. Sorry, guys. And uh, Gitan Welser. Um, this is a very interesting piece because uh, it demonstrates the collaborative process between two different disciplines, two artists bringing their different skill sets to the table and, and really combining them into to one piece. Um, Yvonne has been... Uh, notorious for his photo manipulation skills, while Spartan or uh, Gitan is uh, a matte painter or a digital painter. And these two combined forces and uh, the result is, is pretty cool. It's of uh, a city, you know, melting into some lava there. I think there may be a little bit of the Stargate influence, uh, which I know you're a, a big fan of. Um, <laughs> And just the whole sci-fi aspect to it is, is really cool. It's an it's a interesting combination between the bright glowing lava lights and then this like dark, dingy, rocky uh, plane scene behind it. So another very cool one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got to say I'm a sucker for anything sci-fi related. Right, me, me too, man. <laughs> um, well, Anthony, let's see. Um, looks like you guys have got some really awesome uh, artists um, you know, on staff at Slash 3, and, um, you know, my question is, is I know that we have lots of readers who, you know, are trying to teach themselves Photoshop. Um, you know, we've got lots of readers who are in school, you know, learning Photoshop too. Um, and so my question is, um, you know, in your estimation, do you think that, that the Slash 3 collective or is a grouping of mostly self-taught, or are, have they, um, you know, had a traditional education as well? Right. It's a good question. It's something that I don't know uh, too much about. Uh, I do know that there seems to be a, a pretty consistent mix of uh, self-taught and then uh, formally educated designers there. Um, and the split, ironically enough, seems to be one-sided where it's the older artists seem to be self-taught. Um, now that I think about it, maybe that has somewhat to do with their age and the technology at the time. And so maybe a lot of these guys... Um, as far as getting into the whole digital arena and the development of Photoshop and the progression there, it just wasn't around and accessible. And there weren't these sites like PSD Tuts out for them to, to educate themselves with. And so, uh, you know, they had to do the old uh, tried and true, just walk the, walk the line yourself and, and uh, put in the miles. Um, and whereas the younger kids all seem to be uh, going to, to school and uh, going for the formal education, and that's actually being encouraged by the older designers, um, which brings me into uh, a point that Nick Campbell made, uh, Grayscale Gorilla, in one of his discussions that I think you guys actually posted on your site not too long ago, um, which is that, you know, you have to decide for yourself whether the, uh, the whole school route is appropriate or not. Mm -hmm. It's certainly possible uh, in this day and age, especially with resources like PSD Tuts, um, to really uh, make some serious progress on your own. Um, it, it doesn't take uh, maybe necessarily the hardship or the, like we talked about a minute ago, the putting the time and the miles in and, and sort of trial and error process that it used to. Um, there are some superb, not only books and, and blogs, but uh, tutorial sites like PSD Tuts out there now where people can really get the leg up pretty quickly. And uh, you guys have everything from the basics into more advanced techniques and things. So there's a, a real opportunity that I don't think existed a few years back. Um, but at the same time, the point that Nick Campbell made was if used properly, school can be fantastic. It can be a great time for... Uh, for growth and for getting the, the hard stuff out of the way, um, acclimating yourself to the various uh, applications and software, but maybe more importantly, um, getting into the things that can't really be taught in a video, like composition and color theory and, and stuff like that. And so if you're, if you're paying attention and working hard in college, 
it's a fantastic opportunity to not really have the, the pressures of holding down a job and paying bills and, and all that um, and, and allowing yourself to progress to that next level and have a leg up when it comes time to actually enter the industry. So interesting now, question. Now, do, do you think that, that the educational system is lacking some something in, in terms of you know teaching people you know how to how to learn design or um, is there something miss, missing there are they are they is there, is the is there too much focus on science and mathematics and not enough on design i mean what what is your opinion um, reg regarding sort of the our educational system yeah uh I would argue for the case that that there is not enough emphasis placed on the whole creative field um Obviously, there is an incredible importance for the fields of science and, and uh, mathematics and, and all of that. There, you know, without those things, we wouldn't have the technologies, like you said earlier. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have Photoshop and we wouldn't have all these fantastic applications in the internet and, and all these things, these incredible tools that we use every day to be creative. Um, that being said, I think that times have changed and that our educational system needs to adapt and to to stay current with the times and there are these tools in existence now and they are a huge uh, part of day-to-day -day life for a large portion of people on the earth um, so I, I think that um, while I do understand the importance of, of science and math um, and they will always be there I think that maybe we need to rethink and, and retool and restructure the educational system to properly encourage and cultivate uh, the whole, uh, that portion of the brain, you know what I mean? Um, and it's not to say that I'm, I'm speaking directly to uh, the creative fields as far as illustration and music and, you know, the, the cut and dry creative stuff. Uh, you have to be creative to be an architect, to be an engineer. You have to cultivate innovation and new thoughts and uh, new ways of approaching problems. And uh, so I think on a, a general broad scale, it's important that we readdress and uh, retool our, our system to, to do that. It's awesome. Um, you know, I want to sort of break up, break off just a little bit and sort of discuss something I know we had discussed uh, uh, prior, which was about the Off Festival and the mm -hmm. Slash 3 book. And I was hoping you could tell readers a little bit about those things. Sure. Um, to be honest, I've never been to Off Festival, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it this year. Uh, but I have heard quite a bit about it from the artists in the collective and, and around the internet. And uh, it sounds like it's a fantastic uh, meeting of creative talents. Um, it happens once a year, and it happens, as far as I know, in a different city each year as well. So it keeps the location fresh and makes it easier for maybe the people that, that couldn't spend the extra money to go overseas or, or for whatever reason make it to the event and, and gives them the opportunity to, to do that. So, um, But I think really what it is is a, a fantastic excuse for people in the industry uh, to get together and uh, to meet up and exchange information and to show what they're working on and to network and, and meet and connect and, and uh, you know it can be a lonely place on the internet. There's so many people that are freelancing out of their homes or they don't just have the, the opportunity to connect with these people that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis on the internet. You know, uh, again, like in Slash 3, there's people in 40, 50 countries. And uh, having a, a large-scale event like this where people can they have an excuse to get together and, and uh, to meet in, in person is really invaluable. Um, as far as Slash 3 is concerned with Off, we have been invited this year, which was a really humbling experience, um, to present um, and so actually our, our latest project uh, is directly related to the whole off presentation. We've produced a book that will be being sold and released for the first time at the off festival. Um, it's a combination of brand new works that are relating around the theme of uh, life, death, rebirth, that whole cyclical process, uh, as well as a heritage section, which is the other half of the book. Um, and one of the main reasons we did that was because just with timing, uh, a lot of the, the people that are in the collective are in college or still in school of, of some kind, and it's kind of crunch time and finals for a lot of the guys. And so we wanted to give them the opportunity 
to have their artwork displayed in the book as well. Um, and so it's, it's the second half of the heritage section is more or less a showcasing of some of our, some of the pieces that, that stood out over the last few exhibitions. Um, yeah. It sounds awesome. I, I'm, I'm really excited. I know our readers are, are probably very excited to, to see the book now. Will they be able to purchase the book? They will, yeah. It's going to be for sale for the first time uh, at the Off Festival. And then after that, we're going to be selling it on our online shop, which is still in development, but should be up and ready by the time uh, of the Off Festival as well. Um, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Now, I know we've sort of spent most of our time today discussing um, Slash 3 and how you work with that. But, you know, when you're not doing Slash 3, you're, you've also got a, a design business of your own. And I know recently you decided to, you know, to, to quit the nine to five job and start your own company. And I was, I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's been a, a wild ride to say the least. Um, it's, it's a bittersweet experience. It's something that requires uh, a leap of faith, I guess. And, uh, but at the same time, if you have the, the dedication and the confidence and, uh, just make sure that you follow through with everything necessary in order to ensure the success of that step. Uh, it's, it's an unbelievable, rewarding experience. Um, I would say that uh, before anybody decides to make the transition, it's important to get all your ducks in a row. Um, make sure that you have uh, like a, your accountant lined up. Make sure that your tax situation is lined up. Um, Make sure you've researched on uh, hiring people in that whole process and what it's going to take to then and possibly insure them and to be paying a salary uh, and, and all of those things. So there's, there's a lot to consider. Um, but again, if, if that's something you're interested in, I would absolutely encourage it. You know, it's, it's one of those things where unless you, you just dive in and do it, it's, it's never going to happen. It's, you can always say, oh, I need to save a little bit more money or I'm going to move next year and I'll be in a city where it's more appropriate for me to do this, this change or this transition. And uh, I would just say, go for it. You know, you, you got to just dive in head first and get messy, get your hands dirty and, uh, and work hard to make sure that it's going to be successful. But uh, again, it's, it's a fantastic process. Um, I also, at the same time, really loved freelancing for a couple years prior to that. Um, there's a tremendous amount of freedom and it's, it's really nice and less stressful not having to necessarily concern yourself with uh, all of the other components that are involved with, with running a more formal agency. Um, and the projects are, seem to be more versatile. I think when you start your company, uh, based on your current portfolio at the time, it's almost, at least it's been my experience, it's almost more like you get locked into a particular uh, genre or field of doing things. Um, whereas freelancing, I was approached by people that, you know, Hey, I need a logo or the next day, Hey, I need an album cover for my band or, you know, it, it was a much wider range of work. And, and that was really fun too. And I'm, that's something I'm working on with my company now is to, to reconnect and reestablish that aspect. Cause I, I'm not the kind of guy that wants to do the same thing every day. Like I don't want to just build websites every day. That's, I just, is boring to me, you know, even if the projects for the websites are um, very versatile. Like right now we're working on uh, uh, a woman's company that does 1800s style leather belts and jackets and, and all this, it's beautiful stuff. And then we're also working on developing a website for a, like a snowboard uh, company that, that does snowboard movies. And so the styles of these two companies are radically different. And uh, in that respect, it's, it's fun to, not be so pigeonholed into one particular niche within a niche like web design and one style of web design. Um, but at the same time, like I, I want to mess around in Photoshop and create an, an illustration sometimes and, or sometimes I want to design a logo. So um, it, it's, it's important for me, especially to have a, a versatile client range. I'm kind of getting off track there. So I'll just cut myself <laughs> off. No, that's awesome. And you know, I know our, our readers are, um, you know, very interested to hear what people say. I know there are a lot of people out there very thirsty for information like that because I think a lot of people would love to sort of live that lifestyle, would love to be their own boss, and and it's great to hear uh, to hear you doing it. And and I'm you know we you know we at PSD Tuts you know of course wish you all this all the success that you can that you can find. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And and 
again, just do it. Anybody can do it. It's not as hard as it's made out to, to be. Um, you know, granted, you, you need to have a good work ethic and be able to communicate and deal with people. But um, aside from that, just get your hands dirty. It's an incredible learning experience. And um, again, if you have those two disciplines, you're going to be successful in whatever you do. It doesn't have to be starting a company, you know. It's I anything. So I always say that, you know, um, always try to succeed, but don't, don't be afraid to fail. Exactly. And, That's uh, a huge, huge point. Yeah, absolutely. And, well, um, Anthony, I know um, – this is the uh, s the second or third time we've tried to record this interview, right. and, and so uh, I know we've taken up a, a quite a bit of your time. And um, so, with that said, I just wanted to thank you for participating in this interview, and we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope that this this actually records this time. Right. And, yeah. uh, and thank you for coming out, and we appreciate it. Thanks, Grant. I really appreciate it too, and uh, it's been a, a fun time getting to know you, and. Uh, you know, I feel like I've acquired an, another friend, and uh, it's it's been a good experience. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, the same goes for you, Anthony. And have a have a great day. Thanks, man. You too.